give everyone a moment to get into the room while we get started. And you may notice that as you're coming in, we're just turning off everyone's cameras and making sure that your microphone's muted so we can save as much bandwidth as possible. But if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and while you're coming in, you can also feel free to drop in where you're tuning in from today. All right, I know it is just after 11, so I think we'll get started and people can come in as they join. So welcome to our Freshwater Stewardship webinar series. We're really happy to have you here today. And we're excited to have Sandra as our keynote speaker. She's a PhD candidate at Trent University. And we also have two Watersheds Canada staff with us here today. So my name is Nicole, I'm the environmental technician. And we also have Monica, who's a communications and fundraising manager. And if you have any tech issues throughout the presentation, feel free to send Monica a private message and she'd be happy to help you with that. And now a little bit about Watersheds Canada. Watersheds Canada is a nonprofit and charitable organization based in Perth, Ontario, which is about an hour outside of Ottawa. And we deliver programs across the country in partnership with landowners, community groups, and students who are looking to protect their local fresh water. So you can see on the screen a couple of photos of our programs. So on the top left, we have our Natural Edge program. So that's just working with landowners to naturalize their property using native plants. And then on the bottom left, we have our Love Your Lake program, which is uh, an assessment program where we fill out a shoreline evaluation for each property on a lake and each property owner gets custom recommendations and voluntary actions that they can take to improve their property so that they protect the health of the lake. And then finally on the right, you can see our fish habitat restoration program. So that photo is of our most recent project. And what we did was we put rock on top of the ice so that when the ice melts in the spring, the rocks will fall into place and help restore a spawning bed. So if you have any questions about the programs, you can either put them in the chat or you can feel free to send us an email. And we're all here today because of our Freshwater Stewardship Community, which is an online community that's connecting people from across the country. And it's been going on for about a year. So we have over 1200 members from seven different countries. We have the 15 webinars and 13 handouts archived on our website. So I'd recommend that you check those out later. And the website is watersheds.ca slash freshwater dash stewardship. And we'd also like to thank the Peterborough KM Hunter Foundation and the SM Blair Family Foundation for their funding support for the freshwater stewardship community this year. And I wanted to let you know about a couple of our upcoming webinars as well. So we do have one on Tuesday, that's a lunch and learn. And that one's about winter birding. If you're hoping to improve your birding skills, that's an interesting one. And we also have one coming up on Earth Day, which is April 22nd and is called Rain Smart Neighborhoods. So that one is about landscaping your property to protect your local fresh water. So that one will be interesting as well. I recommend those. And then finally, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Sandra. Sandra is a nature feeler and observer. She enjoys doing science experiments in the water and telling stories about nature. As a scientist, she has had the opportunity to do research in six countries on organisms as small as bacteria or mosquitoes and as big as fish and macaws. She is currently doing her PhD at Trent University where she studies the role of fish, mayflies and mussels play in the cycling of nutrients in streams and lakes. When she's not in the field or the lab, Sandra enjoys sharing her passion for science and water with diverse audiences, particularly with youth and individuals underrepresented in the STEM fields or environmental sciences. And I just wanted to let you know that today we'll be doing our question and answer period a little bit differently. 
Um, so throughout Sandra's presentation, she'll have specific slides where she'll answer some questions. So as you think of the questions, just feel free to put them in the chat. And then when we come across um, those question slides, I'll read them out to Sandra and she'll give us some answers. So now I'll pass it over to you, Sandra. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nicole. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today um, and sharing parts of my research. So I'm going to get my slides shared in a second. All right. So as you can see, my presentation is presentation, sorry, is entitled Brown, Green, or Silver in Your Tea Affects Your Pea, A Fish and Mayfly Tale. Now, I'm going to tell you from now that there is actually more than just uh, a mayfly and a fish tail. There's also a mussel tail, but you will discover that in a second, um, although I don't have the results to show you for the mussels yet. So, um, the way this presentation is structured is, is really around these three themes, the brown, the green, and the silver, which represents each uh, project. And um, each time I will be showing you, you know, the methods, a bit of background, of course, about what we were doing and the methods, and then two sets of results. And hopefully the graphs won't be uh, too hard for you to comprehend. So I'll, I'll try my best to walk you through it so that you can understand what's happening. Some graphs, they may not be, um, uh, they, um, they may be, um, what's the word? They may have some jargon. Uh, so I'll also try to uh, walk you through that part, okay? Um, but before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of the Mississaugag and Anishinaabe, um, and because I'm on uh, Peterborough, Nogojiwano, and I offer my gratitude for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations, um, because thanks to us, we have this wonderful nature, natural environment around us uh, to, to see and enjoy, and in my case, to study, because some of my study sites are right here in Peterborough, so I'm very thankful for um, their wisdom and all they've done um, to steward this land. And since uh, we're giving thanks to the people here, I would also then want to give you a bit of background about myself and tell you about my positionality. So I'm not, uh, I'm not native to Canada, I'm not from Canada. I'm actually originally from multiple countries and have lived in several of them, which has really shaped uh, my interest and passion for water. So um, we are here currently in Ontario. This is where I'm doing my PhD. Prior to that, I was actually in Quebec. I saw someone was from Montreal here. So I was in Montreal at McGill doing my undergrad and I came to Trent to do my master's slash PhD. But I was actually born in France, uh, specifically in Toulouse, where you have um, La Garonne, which is uh, a river that goes through the, the city. Um, I then moved to Côte d'Ivoire with my parents, which is where my dad is from, and lived there for six years. And as you can see, I was living by the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, I really got to see this uh, really intense sea and get to wonder what, what's, what's happening in there. But really, I would say the turning point was when I was in Tunisia, where I spent nine years. Um, this is where my mom is from. And I was by the Mediterranean Sea. And if you've ever been by the Mediterranean Sea, it's a gorgeous place. It's beautiful, it's blue, it's warm, it's very calm. It's lovely to uh, swim in there. And uh, this is really where I got to spend a lot of time in the water and wonder about what's happening under this massive uh, body of, of water. Um, what are, what, what's living in there? Um, and of course, this is this was more in an ocean setting, uh, but um, I got to, of course, uh, expand this to the fresh water, um, which is what I'm studying right now, lakes and streams. 
After Tunisia, I also went to live in Kenya and then in the States. And all these different experiences have really made me uh, fascinated by, um, you know, different natural environments because I really got to see different ecosystems. And, and I decided eventually when I was doing my undergrad that I was gonna focus on, on water specifically. So this is me, little Sandra, when I was in Côte d'Ivoire by the beach and, and just uh, getting a, a sneak peek at this uh, water, which is the Atlantic Ocean here. All right, so we're gonna start with brown in your tea. So if you think about a stream of water, a body of water, what would you have at the bottom? Probably some algae, right? Okay. So according to you, and so um, just also as a little background, I don't have a personally specific, uh, well, I have some slides with questions, um, but I'm, I'm going to be engaging you throughout the presentation to, to, to get you to participate a bit and, and you know, think about uh, what we're talking. And so, um, yes, this is the moment. If we have algae at the bottom of the food chain, then what do you think we'd be eating this algae, for example? You can just drop it in the chat. Ooh, Daphnia, I like this. Fish, yes. Okay, so here we have two examples, one invertebrate and one vertebrate example. And it says exactly that, right? You have some fish that feed on algae that are strictly herbivores. Ooh, rotifer is wonderful. Um, and then you also have invertebrates, a lot of invertebrates, especially in streams um, um, when we have periphytes. And so, uh, you know, algae that's on rocks, um, they love to eat all that green greenery. So in my case here, since we're looking at a stream, it will be a mayfly, okay? So our mayfly is just grazing on, um, yes, insect larvae. So this is what it is. The mayfly here is an insect larvae um, that has an aquatic stage when it's a, a, a lar larva. And then, um, and then when it becomes an adult, then it has this terrestrial stage. Okay, so our mayfly is here, it eats the algae. And what eats the mayfly? Some sort of fish that eats invertebrates. So in this case, we have a pumpkin seed, for example, which is my favorite fish species. And then this uh, pumpkin seed or this invertivore, so a fish that eats invertebrates, will then be eaten up by a fish, a bigger fish. In this case, we have a largemouth bass. Of course, we don't have a largemouth bass in this kind of streams here, but this is just a schematic to think about the food chain in an aquatic environment. Now, this is a very linear way to look at things. And we know that in reality, things are not linear. They're food sources that are coming from different places. And this is how we get to have a food web uh, that is rich and that does not depend only solely on one food item, but on a variety of them. And that is what provides a stability to the system. So uh, what we could have, for example, is terrestrial insects falling into the water and getting eaten up by our pumpkin seed here. Or something else we could have is leaves from the trees too, or um, grass from um, uh, the, the ground that eventually makes it to the water. And so these leaves, this organic matter will then be decomposed by bacteria and will form this brownish matter that will then be part of the system. The same uh, matter can also be coming from upstream. So usually in headwaters, so really more upstream, we have a lot of uh, forestry, we have a lot of uh, trees and, and greenery around the system. And so we get to have a lot of this coming into the water and being decomposed. So a lot of this will then be transported more downstream. And so the bigger 
uh, the, the stream is, um, the less, less likely we'll have uh, this organic matter input from the outside, the terrestrial environment, um, and more likely we'll have it from the inside. So either it will produce it internally by having these algae that we he see here being decomposed or uh, it will be coming uh, from upstream, okay? Although when it comes from upstream, it's still from the terrestrial environment. So this is what I'm interested in, this complexity of interactions at the interface between the aquatic and the terrestrial environment. So this brings us to one of the main topics of my thesis, animal urine, animal pee. So why are we interested in this? Animal urine is essentially, whoop, it just went on. Um, Animal urine is essentially the, um, uh, the product of whatever an individual eats and um, digests and then doesn't need for either, uh, you know, tissue building or for reproduction. Okay, so it's basically the leftover of whatever we have eaten that we don't need, we don't need to, to use. So we discard it and we discard it in our pee. And this is different from the uh, fecal matter, the poo, which is basically whatever we cannot even digest, okay? And so this pee will then be rich in all these nutrients that we have gathered from this food that we don't need, and where does it go? It ends up in the environment, and that's the case for any um, any organism, so it's the same for us, you know, when we go to the bathroom, that gets into our wastewater, and that's why our wastewaters are so rich in nutrients, and that's why we need to treat them, because if we dump that in the water, not only, of course, we have a lot of bacteria and nasty things in there, but we also have a lot of nutrients that would be fueling the system so much that it would just oversaturate it, okay, and lead to things like algal blooms, okay, so um, this is a really important source of nutrients then, right? Because we have also sor uh, sources from uh, the terrestrial environment, just nutrients coming from uh, the ground um, or uh, from the sediments in the water. Um, but this is one of the many sources. And so uh, we think it's quite important to, to look at it because it will really depend on the kind of species you have in the environment, how um, big the populations are, and uh, uh, the whole community structure uh, of the system. The second thing I look at is, um, I should have changed this here to make it less jargony, but essentially clear and brown waters. So in our jargony world, we call um, this brown matter that I've talked about, dissolved organic matter, and we abbreviate it as DOM. Um, and when we look at it, we can look at it from two different perspectives. One from a quantity perspective, we basically look at the concentration, how much carbon do we have in this organic matter? And from a quality perspective, which basically looks at the composition, the chemistry of the brown matter. So um, what are the different components of it? How uh, big is it? Is it easy to degrade for bacteria or not? And those are the kind of things that are really important and that will affect bacterial activity in the system and also how much carbon will be transferred to higher trophic levels um, in the system. So, um, here we have different samples of water from uh, really light, clear water to more brown water. And that just shows you the gradient of brown and clear water that we naturally have in our systems, but which have been changed um, recently because of both climate and land use change. Um, and so we have more carbon being inputted in our systems, and we also have a different chemistry in our systems because of agriculture. And so that affects, as I said, the microbial activity and how much of this gets into the hydrotrophic levels. Oh, you didn't see the change slide. Oops, okay. So that was the previous slide here. Thank you for letting me know. Um, where you can really see the, the leaves here that are heat, that are being decomposed, and that takes a long time, but eventually they form that brown water matter. And the, this is uh, the, um, 
different samples I just mentioned with really brown waters here uh, and uh, less brown, more clear water here. So this is really a big thing that we study in our lab. So what I do is that I look at um, the urine, the nutrient content of the urine of animals. I look at it in relations with how much brown, uh, how brown the water is. And then I also look at it um, from a diet perspective. So here you see different um, species that eat different things. So, you know, we have our largemouth bass, excuse me, it's running, or largemouth bass that uh, feeds on fish. Um, here we have our uh, white sucker that feeds on both invertebrates and plants. We have our uh, black nose dace that feeds on invertebrates. And then here are mayflies that feeds on plants. So that's both fish and mayfly, hence the mayfly tail. So this is the diet component. In our jargony terms, we, talk, we talk, um, call it trophic position. And um, the whole idea basically is that in clear waters, we would expect to have a lot of plants. Why? Because there's a lot of light that comes through the system because the water is clear. So a lot of lights mean um, you know, photosynthesis and so a lot of plants, uh, but there wouldn't be as much nutrients because that brown water, that organic matter is up to bound to nutrients. And so the more brown the water, the more nutrients you'll have in the system. So here we have lots of plants, and so that would probably translate into many animals, fish, invertebrates, but of also low phosphorus content, uh, but with high fatty acids, because with brown water, that uh, the, the the fatty acids comp, uh, component uh, gets um, changed. So that in brown waters, we would expect fewer plants because we have less light coming into the system. But these plants will be of higher phosphorus content because there will be a lot of nutrients. So that will translate in few animals of high phosphorus content, but of low uh, fatty acids, fatty acids. So this is the kind of things that can then makes us think about the abundance of the animals. Oh, are we going to have then more animals in these brown waters? How is that going to affect things like you know, animal pee, because animal pee is really the product of the individual outputs multiplied by how many individuals we have in that population. So abundance. And then body size, yes, because brown water will also affect how big the fish grow. And this is all related to the amount of nutrients that are available. Um, and um, amount of nutrients, but also uh, uh, how, how many food items we have. Because there's this trade-off, as you can see, between the abundance of the food and its nutrition value, right? And so if you don't have much food, even if it's of higher nutrients content, sometimes you would tend to be smaller to compensate for that lack of uh, abundance of food, okay? So that would be the case in brown waters. And so that gets us to think about the population nitrogen and phosphorus release, um, basically the content of nitrogen and phosphorus in the animal pee. Oh. Once again, I think, <laughs> I think there was something with my slides again. So hopefully you've seen that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, I do this along a uh, gradient. I look at really clear waters to more brown waters. And the questions that I'm asking in this specific project is, do the nutrients in fish and mayfly pea change as the water gets browner? And does this change vary relative to the species diet? So let's do some, um, use the scientific method here. You're the scientist. So I'm going to ask you, what are your hypotheses for these questions? What do you think? Oh, OK. I'll go back to the previous slide. Um, this one or the one with the fish and the plants?
Roselli, is it? Yeah, that's the one you want? Okay. So this is just the gradient that I'm showing between clear and more brown water. Okay, so this is your opportunity now to put up some hypothesis. So do you think that the nutrients that fish and may fly pee would change as the water gets browner with the information that you got? And do you think that that would change relative to the species diet? What would you expect? Yes and yes. Okay. Brown water will contain more decomposed nutrients and will be in the P2 and change the color. Ooh, change the color of the P. Very good. Any other thought? Okay, well, that's great. So let's move on to the methods. What, how did we actually do um, this? So we actually went to 11 streams that are spread out, as you can see, uh, across from uh, basically Peterborough area all the way to London. And each stream um, differed in the amount of brown uh, that it had, as I mentioned, the brown water gradient. So in a stream like Jackson Creek here in Peterborough, we had a lot of brown water, whereas in streams like Fish Creek here in the London area, we had a lot less brown water, same here in Humber River, okay? So that gave us a nice gradient. And then we went out as a team and uh, caught many fish species and mayflies, as you can see here. And then we would put each um, fish individual of interest of, for the species of interest that we had into one bag of water. And then we will put these bags into these laundry baskets and then incubate them in the water, meaning we'll put them in the water so that they're at ambient temperature because the temperature really has a strong effect on the metabolism and uh, how much they would pee. And then um, uh, for the mayflies, we would put 10 of them in one bag because they're really small. So for us to be able to detect their pee, we would need a lot of them. So 10 in each bag. And then um, we filtered that water. This is the big step in my work. We filter so much water and it takes a long time. So really try to get rid of any fecal matter because you know, it's in, in the water. So if it gets dissolved, then it would seem like it's the pee, but it's actually not. So we have to really do it right away uh, when we get the fish out um, and then uh, get rid of bacteria that could also just um, take up the nutrients. So really what we have at the end is just water with nutrients. And then what we do at the end is basically take it back to the lab, measure the amount of nutrients in the samples, and then do a subtraction between the original nutrients content of that water that we use here um, and uh, subtract this to the nutrients that we detect in the water after, okay? Um, we also take weight measurements of the fish um, so that we can use this to calculate how um, their rates of uh, excretion. So excretion is the other, jargony term that we use to basically say P. So their excretion rate. What do we do after? Oh, 
some of the cool things uh, when we do that kind of work, um, we um, so we use electrofishing, which, which is the really least harmful um, method for individuals to, or to catch fish. You basically just um, adjust the voltage of your uh, backpack electrofisher when you're in the stream so that it matches the conductivity of the stream and it does not uh, harm the fish and then you stun the fish and then they're just stunned for you know 10 15 seconds and that just gives you time to scoop them out because then you know they float up to the surface and then you put them in your buckets and then eventually they wake up and so sometimes we have really nice surprises like this brown trout here which was my first time seeing and I think it's very pretty um, and then sometimes we have really strange animals too, like this mud puppy here that was caught at Fish Creek, and there was a lot of them. So it's a type of salamander, and it's a uh, it's very very nice to touch. <laughs> Um, what type of filter did we use? A pore size? Uh, very good question. So I don't have the pore size off the top of my head, but we use uh, two filters types. So the first one is called GFF. Um, so we use GFF and then the second one is called, uh, what is it called? Um, yeah, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but it's uh, basically a much smaller membrane um, that really takes everything else, but um, I'll hold on to your question, Conrad, and, and when we have, if we have some time at the end, I'll try to quickly look it up in my uh, documents. Very good question. So our results, here we go. So when we look at fish excretion in our case, uh, we, were, we were both interested in the individual um, rates and also the population rates, which is when you multiply the individual rates by the population abundance. So we uh, were able to look at the population abundance. Um, and so here we have our individual rates. So uh, let's walk through this graph. The green lines are the invertebrates, which is basically the mayfly. The uh, orange line here is the vertebrate or uh, the different fish species that are all amalgamated here, okay? Um, in this uh, first panel, you have the individual nitrogen excretion, and you have the same here, but, um, and, <laughs> Some, some things are missing here. It's because I, I cut some parts of this graph, but essentially what we have here is a gradient of brown water from something like three milligrams of carbon per liter all the way to uh, 16 milligrams of carbon per liter. Uh, whereas here we have um, the, the brown water gradient from a chemistry perspective. And so just as a little background information, so here it's only carbon. Here we basically um, run our water through two different types of analysis, um, or at least um, two different devices in our lab. And then we get a whole bunch of measurements and then we feed all these measurements into uh, a complicated software that then basically runs this whole script and gets us many parameters. These parameters are then used and collapsed to get an idea of the composition of the water. So um, here we would have the, a type of water that's more um, easily, um, or the organic matter would be more easily digestible by bacteria. Um, it would be more something that's coming from within the aquatic ecosystem that was pr produced within. And then when we're on the higher end, it would be more um, organic matter that's really hard to degrade and that has more terrestrial origins, okay? So, um, this we said, or our nitrogen excretion. Here we have our phosphorus excretion on both ends. And then here, um, less interesting, is just a, a ratio of two types of excretion. So let's focus on the first two right here. Um, and so as you can see, um, we're basically thinking that we would see a, a nonlinear relationship between the excretion, so how much nutrients we have in the pea, and the both the quantity and quality of the organic matter. Um, 
And this is something that we see more with the mayflies, the green li uh, line here. So we see that it increases uh, with the increase of brown water in nitrogen. Um, we see that the phosphorus excretion is not as responsive for the mayflies, uh, but a, a little bit more for the fish. Um, and uh, we see that when we look at the quality of the brown water, then there's more response in phosphorus excretion in the mayflies. So a bit of a difficult graph to uh, explain, I guess, but the main takeaway is um, the mayflies were the most sensitive to this. Now, we were not able to really detect anything for the fish. Um, so what we did was to uh, look at them in a very clustered way. So instead of looking at a gradient, we said we have low or clear water in this category, and then we have brown water in this category. And what we found, if you remember the whole uh, hypothesis about uh, the, uh, the effect of diets, uh, we found that there was an effect of diets, a um, little bit, um, on how they responded to how brown the water is. So essentially, the different colors you see here are uh, the diets. So it's abbreviated here, but C is for carnivore, uh, G is for generalist or omnivore, H is for herbivore, and I is for invertivores. Okay. And then uh, we can see that, um, as we've seen before, our mayflies that are here, the herbivores, they're much lower. They excrete a lot less nitrogen and phosphorus than the fish. And when we look at the fish, we really see a nice trend here with the carnivores on top, the generalist after, and then the invertivore after. And this is in the clear water. Then we look at the brown water, we see that the carnivores, they have a lot less, I mean, they have a little less um, in the brown water, the generalists, they increase, and then the invertivores, they are pretty much the same, but essentially they're all a little bit different, okay? That's the main takeaway. Same for the phosphorus, they're all a little bit different. So diet has an effect on how much nitrogen and phosphorus they would pee, okay? So if we go back to these questions, um, do the nutrients in fish and mayfly have pee change as the water gets browner? Yes, specifically for the mayflies, they would change more for the mayflies. Then when we uh, look at a clustered uh, analysis, then for the fish, it becomes more apparent, especially from a diet perspective. So that, that change varies relative to, this, to the species diet. Okay. Okay, next. Uh, green in your tea. So we're going to try to be a little faster this time because we're almost uh, out of time. So now you have a bit of background about um, the kind of work I do. You know, I look at fish urine and I really do that in different systems. So in that case, it was in streams that had this clear to brown water gradient. In this case, it was in Lake Erie. Everybody's familiar with Lake Erie and especially the Western basin of Lake Erie. So as you know, um, the Western Basin is often prone to algal blooms, massive algal blooms. This is a very extreme version of it. When we went out there, it was not like that at all. But it just gives you a bit of an idea of the type of response you can get to the amount of nutrients you have in the system. And we would expect that if there's a lot of nutrients in the system, as we mentioned before, it would have some effect on the food, which would, would or could have an effect on the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, content of the P of the animals we look at. So this time we had specific species, species in mind that we wanted to sample, but um, I bet that some of you fish, uh, you know that things don't go as planned. And so we did not get the fish species that we wanted, just a few of the ones. So we were just very opportunistic. Whatever we get, we take it. And so we ended up having things like Oh, a beautiful largemouth bass, but also a goldfish in the Lake, Lake Erie West, Western Basin. Uh, we had around goby too, right? Why not? Invasive species. Let's look at what this invasive species does. Uh, we had white perch. Uh, that one was actually one of the species we were interested in. And then we had a brown bullhead right here. 
This is some of the few species we had. We had a lot more and I will show you in a second. Um, and this work uh, was uh, quite intense. Uh, we had to drive from Peterborough all the way to um, uh, Windsor. So we packed a whole bunch of our equipment. And one of the big things that we do before we start sampling is filling up these big water jugs with water and filtering that water. This is the water that we end up using for the experiments because it has to be the same water for all the individuals we test. So just filtering this massive amount of water in all these water jugs. And then we do the experiment. And then we had a lot of late nights just filtering the water and then um, both outside and inside uh, of the lab that we had there. But that came with like really cool results. So the questions we were asking, oh, before I get there, I'm just gonna, yeah, give you a bit of background about the methods. So uh, this time we didn't use a backpack electrofisher, we used a boat that you see here that has this really cool, these cool hands that stun the fish too. We also use some uh, gill net sets, but then we stopped using it because as you can see, it's awful for the fish. They get caught um, from an ethical perspective. I really don't like it. And uh, we don't wanna have fish that are harmed and, and hurt when we do the experiment and all bloody, right? It just skews the experiment. So we want it to be healthy and peeing well. Then we put the fish in the bags, as you see here. Um, and then uh, we filter, as you know, we filter a lot of water. One of the things we also looked at is actually quagga mussels. So we also did the same experiment with about 10 quagga mussels uh, in the water. As you may know, they are invasive too, like the round goby, and they're actually a prey item for the round goby. And we were interested also in the content of their tissue, um, how much phosphorus and nitrogen is there in their tissue. So this is also an experiment we did. And so to give you an idea of uh, what happens in the lab after, I have this quick video. So this is when we have grounded all the muscles and we made it into a powder and we analyze it. This is when we have all the samples and we have to uh, pour standards to be able to look at uh, the nutrients. So here it's phosphorus. Then we use this device to uh, look at the nutrient content of each sample. And then it comes into our laptop. That was really quick, but just to give you an idea of what it is like to be in a lab. Okay. Okay, so the, new, the questions we asked were, how much nutrients do fish and mussel populations contribute to the Lake Erie Western Basin? Does it change with diet? And we measure diet this time by using what we call stable isotopes. And how does that compare to other sources of nutrients? So our results are right here. So F stands for fall and S stands for summer because we did that both in the fall and in the summer. Okay, so we were interested in seeing how that would change and the results are very clear. We don't often get these things in science, so this is great. Uh, but essentially for both nitrogen and phosphorus excretion, we can see clearly that they pee a lot more uh, phosphorus and nitrogen in the summer, right here in blue, than in this, uh, the fall. This is all the fish species, all the individuals we caught. This is only the fish, not the mussels. Why is that? Temperatures are higher, more nutrients in the system. And so that's the kind of things that could fuel this kind of response. When we look at it specifically by species, I apologize, this may be really confusing for you, but we also see the similar pattern for each species. So here we have all the species. So we have brown bullhead, goldfish, gizzard shad, largemouth bass, lock perch, northern pike, brown goby, walleye, white perch, yellow bullhead, and yellow perch. But you see that some, it's just the bar or just one little dot. It's because we only caught one or two of these. So as I said, we were really opportunistic. So we caught whatever we could, but really usually we want to try to have at least 10 individuals to have a good measurement of this. And that was not always the case. So we may get rid of some of these species when we look at it at a species uh, level um, later, because we can't just look at one individual. Okay, um, and so here, uh, the main takeaway is that you see that some fish species, 
excrete a lot more than others. This is the case, for example, here with um, the gizzard chat. You see here that they excrete a lot more phosphorus than other fish species here. Um, here we have the white perch. They also excrete a bit more um, than other species, okay? Nitrogen seems to be a, a bit more, well, like equally distributed relatively. So the questions we ask, um, how much nutrients do fish and mussel populations contribute to the Lake Erie Western Basin? I'm not gonna tell you exact, the exact number, but they, they contribute some and we wanna then compare it to other sources of nutrients. So this is the next step of the study. Does it change with diet? Yes, uh, probably, but we don't have the, the data yet. Does it change with season? That's the main thing. Yes, it definitely does change with the season, okay? So the next analysis we're going to do is gather some data on the fish species abundance to then look at it at a population level and then uh, get the fish diet results from uh, looking at the chemistry of their tissue. And then that will allow us to look at both the effect of diet and season together on how much nutrients they put out. Um, I'm rushing a little bit because I, I see that I'm a bit out of time. So uh, bear with me for another uh, five minutes max. Uh, but uh, next is the last piece of our puzzle. We looked at the brown, we looked at the green. Now let's look at the silver in your tea and how that affects your pea. So what is silver? Silver is actually referring to nanosilver particles. So uh, this is a really large experiment that happened in uh, the experimental licks area. I don't know if any of you is familiar with that, but it's a really big spot for uh, aquatic scientists. Um, this is a place where you had 58 lakes that have been allocated for scientists in Northwestern Ontario and where they can do big experiment. This is how we figured out what's happening in the Lake Erie Western Basin because we did phosphorus addition to some lakes and then looked at what happened. And this was a major experiment done um, by a famous scientist in our field. And uh, we did something similar this time, this time looking at nanosilver particles addition uh, to lakes and how that affects everything from the bacteria to the algae to the invertebrates to the fish. Now, I wasn't there. This actually happened in 2012 to 2015, um, but I got to uh, gather the data and then look at the results. So the way it happened is that they would, um, um, they basically looked at everything before they added the nanosilver particles in 2012. So that was the pre-exposure time. And then in 2014 and 2015, they just dumped a bunch of nanosilver particles to this one lake. Um, that would be just diffuse from this point source. And then they looked at a whole bunch of parameters. Um, so the results across the food chain, I mentioned algae and invertebrates and bacteria, they were pretty mixed. Some responded, some had, for example, different changes in the nutrient content of their tissue. Um, some had a different community structure uh, because of, of this addition. Um, did the pH of the water body influence your results? Specifically in the nanosilver particles uh, experiment, I, I don't even have myself in my experiment pH data, but I could uh, for sure get it, I think, because it was a large experiment involving many people. Um, I don't know if other people looked at the effect of pH, but I'm curious to know uh, what, what do you think would be the interaction? Like, do you think it would be interacting with the nanosilver particles? Um, but yeah, I don't have pH data, so I don't know, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, it did some of these things and then other, other parts of the food chain didn't have any effect, didn't show any effects. So it was really mixed. And so the questions we asked is, do nanosilver particles affect nutrients in yellow perch pea? Because this time we didn't look at many species, but just looked at one, yellow perch. And then, does silver in the yellow perch pea change from year one to year two of nanosilver particles addition? So from 2014 to, to 2015. 
So we went and collected 20 yellow perch um, each time in 2012 before the exposure, then in each year of exposure. And then we looked at their T. So here are the results. Essentially here again, we have nitrogen excretion. Here we have phosphorus excretion. What can we see? Essentially uh, in the lake where you add, we added the um, nano silver particles, which is 222 right here in black, um, we see that it was pretty similar to our reference lake. This is basically the lake where we didn't do anything. Um, and uh, we looked at the same data, but we didn't add anything. And so we see that they're pretty similar pre-exposure for nitrogen excretion. <clears throat> but after the uh, addition of nanosilver particles, we see that they both increased, um, both the reference and the treated lake. And we see a lot of variation for the treated lake right here, but they're not actually different. They're not, uh, there's no statistical evidence that they are different. So it may be just other factors contributing to them having more, but the variation we see here could be due to the effect of nano silver. okay? Now, when we look at phosphorus, this is when things get really weird. So we would expect that before the experiment, both lakes would be similar as we've seen for nitrogen excretion, but this is not the case for phosphorus. We see that the two lakes are very different. Uh, at the beginning, before we added the nanosilver particles. And so we've really been scratching our head, trying to understand and explain what's happening. Likely something else, there been, they were feeding on other prey, prey items. The prey items that are available in these two lakes are actually different and have different content of nitrogen and phosphorus, specifically phosphorus in this case. And so that could affect that initial difference. But we see that with the addition, of the nanosilver particles over time, we see that they become more similar. And specifically for the treated lake, we see in black that it increases in phosphorus excretion. Okay, so um, that could suggest that there's a bit of an effect directly on the treated lake, um, but the fact that we don't we don't have uh, they're not similar at the beginning. From a scientific perspective, it makes it really hard for us to say, yes, it's because of the nanosilver particles. So this result is a little more confusing. So really the main takeaway from this is there's no strong evidence that the nanosilver particles are affecting the nitrogen and phosphorus um, content of the fish bee. Now, this is the very clear result right here. This is looking at how much silver is being uh, peed out by the fish. And one, it is clear that they pee silver when they are exposed to silver. And two, that uh, excretion, that pee increased from the first year to the second year of nanosilver particles addition, meaning that maybe the second year they had accumulated even more because of being exposed for so long to the total to the nanosilver particles. And so um, they basically even more um, to try to basically clean themselves out of this nano silver. So, or yeah, the total silver. So this is really the main takeaway from this is that they excreted a lot of that silver probably to clean themselves out of this uh, toxic material. So to answer the questions, does it affect yellow perch pea? Mm, not sure, not really, it doesn't seem like it. Um, does it change from the first to the second year of um, nano silver particles addition? That's a sil silver change. Yes, it does. It increases. Okay. Why is that all important? Uh, well, nano silver particles are really present in a lot of uh, products. Um, products that we use at home, the mess for domestic use, um, like some creams or things that we use for our faces and all, and they end up in our water. And so the really uh, strong motivation was to see um, if it affects the biodiversity, then maybe we should have a policy that uh, really constraints and limits how much nano silver particles we end up having in our system. Woo, I hope I was not uh, talking too fast. I hadn't realized it would be that long, uh, but this is, uh, this is the end of, of this whole uh, story about different components that can affect um, fish, mayfly, and mussels too, pea. 
And as you can see, it's, it's complex. It depends what we're looking at. Um, but um, all of that is uh, to, you know, give you a bit of information about this uh, important source of nutrients uh, for uh, systems, aquatic systems. And with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, the incredible teams I've worked with in each of these projects to be able to get these results because these are really field work intensive, lab work intensive uh, type of work. And uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, I'm happy to take any question. And I see that there's a question here by David already. But I guess I'll, I'll give it back to uh, Nicole and Monica before we start answering. <laughs> sure, thank you so much for your presentation, Sandra. Um, so yeah, you can feel free to answer that question from David. It says, what are the seasonal results for nitrogen and phosphorus excretions of quagga mussels? That's an excellent question. And the reason I didn't show it is because um, this is data I collected last summer, uh, last summer, last fall, and uh, I haven't had time to fully analyze it yet. Um, and I wasn't able to, I don't have the data for the muscles yet. Um, and one of the challenges we usually, as I mentioned, look at the weight of the individuals to then correct the excretion rates of the animals. And for some reason, the relationship between the weights and the excretion rates of the muscles were weird. So I was not able to correct it yet, so I don't know yet. But I will definitely look at it, and uh, hopefully I can share you know, the future publications uh, of this with Watersheds. And if you guys are interested, you can have a look. Yeah, that would be great. And then everyone will notice that uh, Monica just dropped a link to a survey in the chat. So if you have a moment, if you wouldn't mind letting us know how the webinar went, if you have any recommendations, or if there's any topics that you're hoping to hear in the future, we would love to hear that. And we'd just like to th thank Sandra again, um, and thank everyone for your questions and attending the webinar. And we hope that you have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.